I'm gonna explain to you real quick. Don't be rolling yet. There's a reason for it. I'm gonna get all over the map here, but I'm seeing a. a I'm a little perplexed, but you're gonna have to fill me in. I, I so I'm a big user of TikTok and and Instagram and and uh, all of a sudden one day I'm looking at an, an, a TikTok. Your name is not on it. It says nothing of you, mm-hmm. but you're apparently riding bareback on a horse. Yeah. What's the story? I, it, it, it's I for my birthday I wanted to go and go to Morocco and ride this guy's horses. I've been following him on Instagram and he has these horses that he just, they're just beautiful. And he's constantly running them down the beach. And when I was a kid, uh, my favorite movie movie was the black stallion. So Mm -hmm. all I wanted to do was, um, ride a horse down the beach without reins, without um, a saddle and just go for it. And I've been riding since I was three years old. So I found the guy, I rode him. I said, Hey, if I come to Morocco, can I ride your horses? And he said, yeah, if you can ride, come. I flew out to Morocco uh, with 10 of my friends and I shot this video and it was just for my birthday and it was for me. And it was something I wanted to do my whole life. And it went, I put a couple videos up. It went viral. And, And what's a bummer is that I didn't put my name in it. Like I just posted it, you know, and one was just a story and the other one I posted on my, you know, my regular page and it took off like wildfire, but I didn't, I just didn't even think it would do that. So people took the video. I'm not even on TikTok and I have hundreds, probably over a hundred million views on one of my videos. No, I I will tell you, I I had to look at it like five times. I'm like, I know this girl. (laughs) I know her. She has no reins. She looks like she's barely dressed. I mean, you're dressed, but it's like a flowing dress, and yeah. it's on some exotic scene. I'm like, Carrie, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I mean, no, it was great. I just was like, I was trying to figure out, like, is are you, are you promoting something? I was, I, I looked everywhere, no. and you weren't. People you were pro- thought, no, people thought it was like some kind of ad for perfume or for like makeup or whatever. And they said, what you know, are you on a shoot for a movie? And it was literally an iPhone and a horse. No, I literally, I literally, I literally thought, okay, Carrie's going to be the next Chanel girl. I'm like, what in the, I really did. I thought this ad, this, this, this thing you did, which was, was dramatic. And we're going to, of course, this is a recorded podcast. So we're going to play the video. Trust me. Okay, cool. The video is, (laughs) the video is beautiful. It's Carrie riding a horse. Um, And I'm glad you cleared that up for me because I'm like, and then I went to your Instagram and I found that it was you. I'm like, okay, but what's the whole promotional aspect of all these other people promoting your video? And I don't know if you know this, but it literally, you said you had a hundred million views. It's everywhere. I know. I, on I, I, other so, people's TikToks all over the place. Like I, it's, it's crazy. I've never seen anything like it. People think I have a oh, way over a hundred million views. Yeah, well, um, it's, I, it's, because it was shared hundreds of thousands of times. I've never had this happen. So, I mean, people were sending me screenshots of, you know, some people would have 25 million views. Some people would have 10 million views. Some people had like, and then I would, I would write them and say, Hey, can you please give me credit? You know? And they would, some of them, some of them wouldn't. So I had a copyright and took it down, taken down. I'm like, just give me credit. That's all I'm asking, but I don't have a TikTok. So if you're on TikTok. And you find who that is, just say, hey, listen, give Carrie Kate some credit. <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that. Uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm for sure on TikTok, and I got about a million something in Instagram. So I There you go. I, I'll, I'll rebroadcast. I'll put it out and say, hey, everyone who's watching this, this is Carrie Case, and we'll, we'll do that Thank for sure. You. <laughs> uh, you know, what's funny, I'm not going to get into how I know you from some other things you've done. I don't know that that's relevant. Um, nothing bad, of course, obviously. All the stuff you do is wonderful. Um Thanks. But I always thought when I first saw you that I met you at a Ryan Seacrest party, but I guess I didn't. I don't know how I initially met you. Um, I mean, it could have been if it was a very long time ago. It, it was a long time ago. Um, well, I was at a birthday party for him. And then I saw you again, of course, uh, I don't know, was it f- seven or eight years ago? Um, I saw you doing a lot of the advocacy work. You do a bunch of stuff on your own, and I saw you... 
during the fires rescuing dogs and and so I'm just curious as to like what your day is like because one day there's massive fires and I see you on TV uh, in Malibu rescuing dogs from the fire and there was a blazing fire behind you like it was like yeah. <laughs> raging fire I'm like what are you a fireman too I, I so what is it you're doing now I mean we could talk about that um, sure. and then and then I you know near and dear to my heart is obviously I my my father has Alzheimer's. He's in a clinic. My mother-in-law died from it. I founded Alzheimer's and Neuro, which recently went public. I think you know that. I've talked to you about yeah. that. those two drugs out of the University of South Florida, which have a lot of promise. Um, I've seen you do work for advocacy for the elderly, what's happened with your father, which I know is a very dramatic experience for you. So I'm going to leave let the stage open to talk about what you're doing now because to me, I, I think you're one of the most fascinating people I've known. I haven't spent oh, a lot thanks. of time with you. I always get these little, I'm allowed like, it's like somehow the world only allows me five minutes with Carrie at a time, whether it's at an event or with Brad or Grant or something. So what are you doing right now? Oh, what am I doing? There's, I mean, a lot. So I did uh, just put out a podcast. I worked a year on with an executive producer named Aliza Rosen. It's for Audible and it's doing extremely well, but you know, I've been talking about my dad's case and what I've gone through for the last seven and a half years, and I thought we were going to get a trial, which we didn't get. So I put together all the depositions of the doctors, the caretakers, the friends, the family, everybody who knew what was going on, and I just made a podcast out of it. Like, if you were to listen to the trial, this is what you're going to get. And, um, is this bitter, is this bitter blood? Is this bitter blood? It is. It's bitter blood. It's called Kaysen versus Kaysen. And you can listen to it on audible and audible. If you don't have it already, it's free for 30 days and you can listen to it in a day or two. But I mean, we had such a huge response to that mm -hmm. and it was very cathartic for me. And I feel like there's a lot of closure for me. And, uh, and so that was, that was amazing. And then I, I'm now fielding offers to take it to television or a movie. Um, I'm working on a documentary about my father's life, not the salacious stuff, but, you know, his life and his humanitarian uh, efforts and, you know, what he did in his, uh, in his life, not, not only just being, you know, Casey Kasem, but a dad and a, this amazing man. So um, those are the projects I'm working, working on now, along with my nonprofit case and cares, um, I've done several documentaries uh, dealing with guardianship abuse. And it, I mean, there's, there's so much now with this horse thing that you brought up, which is so crazy that this has happened to me because my whole life was horses and my whole childhood was horses. So here it comes a full 360 and I'm here taking offers for photo shoots with horses around the world, which is unbelievable. It's just like such a dream come true. And um, it's just, for me, like the happiest place I can be is with horses and at the barn. So I had no so idea. I had, I want to say I had no idea what you're going to tell me about the horse thing. I, I, I went and saw it, and I'm like, take it to my wife. I'm like, look at this. This is Carrie. Do you remember <laughs> Carrie? I'm like, remember Carrie? This is Carrie. I know it's Carrie. It doesn't say Carrie anywhere. And I'm like, but this is Carrie. I, I know her like her face perfectly. This is Carrie. I'm like, what in the heck? And so I said to her, Christy, is she like a spokesmodel now? Like, you know, how, like you, you eventually see like Elizabeth Arden has like, sure. you know, or Charlize Theron or someone's doing something. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Carrie's an, like ridiculously beautiful. So oh, someone thanks. figured it out and said, let me make you a model of on uh, some sort of perfume. I think it's fascinating. And I bet big things come from that because you looked amazing. Oh, thank you. And, and it, um, I kind of felt like it's a strange thing. When I looked at it, I, I thought, I know that this COVID thing has been terrible for a lot of people. And I thought it was inspirational. I thought, well, maybe she's doing something for like, yeah. hey, you can still get out there. I'm going to do something during COVID times. I didn't know where you were going with it to find out that it was just a personal decision <laughs> to ride a, a horse. It was a personal thing I wanted to do for my birthday. That was it, literally. And, you know, they say, do what you love and the rest will come. Right. I've never had such a response in my life to anything I've ever done, ever done. And I mean, I'm, I've done some pretty big things in my life and I've never had this kind of response. So 
I, it's just been, it's been amazing for me. It's been a fun journey. I've, you know, I'm constantly now getting asked to ride people's horses and do photo shoots. <laughs> like I, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's beautiful. The, 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 I know we're switching around a little bit, and I apologize, but Bitter Blood, it's only available on Audible. Are you expecting it to be anywhere else, or what's the scenario No, nope, right now it's just Audible. It's just Audible. It's an Audible original. They're the ones who said and who had the courage to – it was with a lot of people. A lot of people, oh, we'll do the story, we'll do this, and I don't know. I can't, They just had the courage. I, all I can tell you is that you know my stepmom is very, very litigious, and – um, she sues everybody, but this was depositions. And so what we did and made it safe for people to be able to talk because you can't sue somebody for what's in a deposition. Mm. So that was the way I could get this out there and really, really show the other side, not just coming from my, um, it's just not me telling the story anymore. It's mm. people that I didn't even know behind the scenes right. and it's their depositions. You'll hear it. And it's, it's more awful than what the news ever talked about hey those of you who are watching the show we're going to have bitter blood a link to it on audible you'll be able to find it for carrie and go watch it or excuse me listen to it it's obviously a an original um and those of you and we have a large alzheimer's community dementia community out there we are a supporter of this community let's make sure we get this out there and make sure it gets heard so people can understand what's happened and her journey and what's happened with her very famous dad who was a was a very charitable person himself. We need to make sure that this story gets told. And obviously, the laws out there uh, didn't didn't particularly help Carrie. Um, I mean, I don't think that the, the situation was um, wasn't ideal. Uh, let's just say that. I know this is a no, but that's why I changed the laws. So yeah, for sure. When you you know there was no there, and there still are uh, very little laws that protect adult children trying to see their elderly or vulnerable parents. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's, they're very weak and you see a lot of guardianship, fraudulent guardianship. You see these people come in and take your mom or dad and take everything they've ever worked for. And in the case of Britney Spears, uh, you know, there's so many, you only hear about it when it's celebrities, right? That's it. Sure. And so, I mean, Mickey Rooney, um, Glenn Campbell, uh, they tried to do it to Buzz Aldrin, um, Michelle Nichols from Star Trek that's happening to her right now. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really horrible what, what's going on. But Britney Spears and the Free Britney movement really put a huge light on what is happening in our court system and the atrocities that are going on there. So hopefully this next year we'll really, we'll get to go federal and, and, and get a bill that stops this. What's the, what's the story about the documentary for, about your father and what are you expecting I mean, is that is that fully produced yet? Is that something? No, not at all. We just started. Just started. Just uh, you know, just just starting. Um, just starting on it. So. Is there a lot of sponsorship behind? Do you have producers and people that are willing to step up and sponsor it? There's some, and and we're just. I mean, it's the very beginning of it, and I'm excited about it because there is a huge company. I can't talk too much about it because. You know, we, we're just in the very beginning of it, but um, it's a huge company. I'm sure you hear people rave about this, like I do. How much they listened to him, you know, recognized him, looked forward to listening to him. Um, and in, anyways, had that sort of uh, gentle voice. Um, I love that uh, my father touched so many people. Like, I am so proud that, you know, of him and, and, and how he was as a human being. And not only touching people from his show, but just all the humanitarian work he did that people don't know about. And he was just always taught us to help others, you know, and that's the most important thing. Be kind and help others. And it just, I can't tell you how much it touches me. It doesn't matter how many times I've heard it. I love my dad and I feel like, you know, he is one of the reasons I am who I am today. So you can't say it enough. You still, uh, you still call Los Angeles home? I, I split my time between LA and Tampa, go back and forth. I'd like to do six months, one day out here. Um, I'm in Florida now uh, for, you know, just to get out of L.A., tax purposes. Just a lot of my friends are here. So, yeah. you know, Tampa is the home of USF, the university that developed the two vaccine, the vaccine and the treatment for that we just brought public. I don't know if you knew okay. that it's that mm -hmm. university, University of South Florida, the Bulls, uh, Dr. Chow and Dr. Scheidel, um, Zara Rocco, Dr. Smith, all those guys down there over the last 10 years. Um, 
were the developers of the vaccine, which we expect to be in patients in December, January, and the current co-crystal lithium treatment, which just went into patients on September 10th, so about uh, about 12 days ago. So we're, uh, okay. I know it's funny, when I first got to know you, I said to you, hey, I, I formed a company and I'm going to have a treatment and a, a vaccine for Alzheimer's. You probably thought I was a lunatic. No, not at all. Come on. I think it, I, uh, not at all. Come on. I meet people that think big and are, you know, are doers and movers and shakers. And sure. I think it's awesome. So um, you, you, and I believe people. Speaking of changing things, you've, you've changed a lot of laws. I thought maybe we could talk about what you've done in that area and kind of what you're working on now. Sure. You know, um, when I went to court to see my dad because my stepmother had uh, turned off all his communication stopped allowing his um, his driver to take him to see us because we saw my dad every single week. Uh, we talked to him every day on the phone. And uh, when my father got sick enough where he needed somebody to help him dress and get up out of bed, she fired his staff. She uh, turned off his phone, computer, anything. He couldn't get a hold of us. And uh, we did a protest outside the house with my dad's like octogenarian friends. With my, with my dad's coworkers, family members, and everything was just a sign that said who they were and how, you know, how long they'd known him. And my sign said, Gene, why won't you let me see my dad? And, and that, that was the, what, what broke the story because I knew that if it was just me saying, my stepmom won't let me see my dad and my brother and sister beside me, it was going to be stepkids against stepmom. And I said, no, it's all of us. Nobody can see my dad. And that didn't work. She still didn't let us uh, see him. The police didn't help. Adult Protective Services didn't help. So we went to court, and I very quickly learned that there were no laws allowing adult children to see their, uh, you know, elderly or vulnerable or sick parents if there's an uncooperative caretaker. So I said, okay. I was told by my first two lawyers I'd never win a case against a wife of 34 years. I fired them. I got a new lawyer, and I said, if I'm not going to win in court, I'm going to change the law. I ended up winning in court, and I changed the law. And I didn't stop at just, you know, California. I changed the law uh, with my amazing team at Case and Cares. Couldn't have done it without them, especially Kathy Braun. Um, we, we got 12 states with 13 bills, and nine other states adopted a version of the Case and Cares visitation bill. So we have 21 states with 22 bills. Wow. I'm, I'm like, uh, I don't know about you guys in the, in the studio, but you got to be, like, blown away by that. I was actually blown away by just you saying – the logic that she wouldn't let you see your dad after you're requesting it is just, uh, uh, I was trying to put myself in that position about what that would feel like to not be able to see your father. Um, yeah, it's, it's horrible. It was horrible. And it happens, it's happening every day to thousands of families in America and Canada. And I get, I get, I get email from Australia, Canada, England, uh, and, and the U.S. I get tons of it. And people want me to bring the law over to a lot of Canadians. We need help over here. Well, so, uh, no. No, knowing you in the, little, in the small way that I do, I remember seeing some pictures of you and your father when you were younger, and I was immediately flashed back to the idea. I know that you were close with your dad. The idea that you could, didn't, suddenly couldn't see him. Yeah. And there's no laws protecting your ability to see him. It's interesting because I know in California there are laws that if – uh, let's say my son were to get a woman pregnant and have a baby out of wedlock. There are laws that allow us, us as grandparents to see our grandson yeah. or granddaughter. Very true. And you're saying there are not laws to allow an adult child to see their father who's being taken care of caretaker. And you got that law changed. Um, I got, I got, um, I got a law, a visitation bill where you can go and you can ask a judge for a visitation without going through an entire trial fight uh, without spending, like a lot of people don't have enough money for a retainer for a lawyer, let alone an entire fight in court. Right. So this law bypasses all that. You can go into the, the judge and say, look, you know, we were seeing my dad up until this or my mom up until this. And this person has, you know, uh, vilified all the family members, has uh, isolated, over medicated. And there, you know, it, there's, there's a saying in our, in our activism world, isolate, over medicate, steal the estate. And this is what uh, people with power of attorney, guardianship, and conservatorship do. Hmm. And not all not all caretakers are bad people. They're not. But we, I deal with the worst of the worst. Case and cares. Yeah. And and 
can we talk about like what is it a charitable foundation? Is a how how is it set up in the sense? It's, a, it's I, we have two. We have a five hundred one c three and a five hundred one c four. One is set up just nonprofit, and uh, it's for educational purposes. We can back um, bills. We can't really lobby, but we can put throw our you know name behind it and our weight behind it. But we have another one set up um, just for lobbying purposes uh, and for uh, tax purposes. You have to have them separate. Sure. And uh, I, I learned that when I got into it. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. So one of them's um, one of them's tax deductible, like a tax deductible gift. Yes, and one of them is not. Is that the five hundred one C three? Is that the tax? Yeah, the C three is tax deductible. Right. And then, and and how do you raise money for it? Uh, we do huge conferences every year and this last year we couldn't so raising money has been a challenge and mm -hmm. uh and so we had to get rid of our executive director and you know really cut back on everything because we don't we have to we have to raise money and there's people who have amazing ideas and, and they're like look we can do it this way this way and this way so we're going to change it up a bit and start and start um doing fundraisers online and things like that mm -hmm. but it you was it was having this huge conference every year and we sell tickets and, and we would get donations and it was great. And I have, I also do have some donors that donate large sums every year, which has been really like a godsend. How, how much do you, like, do you have a targeted budget in mind you try to raise or, and you don't have to go into particulars. I always know when I ask yeah, these yes, questions. Yes, of course. Yeah. We do, we do. And, and our last amazing executive director, um, Diana Judovitz, who was with the Shoah Foundation, uh, she really, really was amazing. We want her back because she, she just completely organized everything and, and got our, and we were ready to do this conference and then COVID hit and it canceled everything. And oh, that's it was, terrible. It was a bummer. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. the last time I saw you, when we talked about what I was working on all summers, you said that you had something, uh, <laughs> you know, the funny part about it is, is that I see, because I actually... So the, the ironic part about it is if my company went to zero because someone else had a treatment or a cure for Alzheimer's, it would be a success. I would be like, okay, this yeah. is a yeah. – because Alzheimer's and dementia are, are so expensive for caretakers, the economy. I don't think people realize what the, the nearly 6 million people, the drain on the economy, the difficulty, the aggravation that these Alzheimer's patients feel. My father is violent now, upset. It's a it's a tough thing for them, and you mentioned to me something about coconut oil, and I've heard various things about it. But you have some direct experience. I was curious about what was happening there um, since the last time we talked. Well, my friend Esmeralda owns a memory clinic in Visalia, and her accounts of these people and what the testimonies are just unbelievable. She will get. You know, she cooks with with um, coconut oil only, and she gives scoops of coconut oil to every single patient, and they come out of almost being catatonic. Some people are just sitting there drooling. There's nothing there, and two weeks later, they're talking. Four weeks later, you know, there's this one lady who came in a wheelchair drooling completely out of it. Two weeks later, she was talking. Four weeks later, her family walks in, and she goes, you know, where, there you are. You finally came, like, just like a, a her personality was back and I, I mean this happens this, her testi testimonies are oh it's it's like every single one you're like I cannot believe this is happening so I had my uncle start taking it and um his daughter was like it's it's amazing it's like it's quite an improvement um but I'm not saying it's a cure you know but they there is something called a ketone ester I guess which is so extremely expensive to make these pills but they know it works it's 10 times more powerful than coconut oil and uh but there's no funding for it and I mean I just we need something and if yours works hey I, I'm like you I don't care what it is it's this has got to got to come to an end it is so horrifying when this hit, hits one of your family members my my uncle um has it my grandfather died of it and my dad had Lewy body dementia so like you my family has this and if it ever happens to me god forbid i hope to god you know whether it's your you know cure or somebody else's i i hope there is one well first of all i didn't know your dad had Lewy body yeah well that is a terrible form of dementia yeah, wow, is. that must have been very difficult. Oh, my God. 
It Would, was, but the one thing that was a saving grace about this hor- horrifying disease is he never didn't know who we were. Like he knew we, who we were every time with Alzheimer's and my and like my uncle or my my grandfather. It was like sometimes they don't know you're like a stranger, right? Right. It never happened with my dad. No, my dad for sure does not know who I am. He looks at me yeah. funny. He doesn't know my name. He doesn't know I'm his son for sure. Um, yeah. So let's talk about, so obviously coconut oil is used in, when you use, when you go on the keto diet, I mean, it's actually a recommended I- issue. And you're saying that synthetically they take coconut oil into some sort of ketone ester. I didn't understand that part. Can you go elaborate yeah, a little bit? It's called a ketone ester. And um, now I've just, all I've seen is, uh, you know, uh, snippets on the news. And I have one on my phone that when anybody says their parents, they have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I sent it to them. And it was a woman who's a doctor whose husband got Alzheimer's. And she just started giving him, he couldn't do the clock test. He couldn't pass anything. He was really losing it. And she started giving him like a scoop of coconut oil every single morning. And it changed him so drastically. He could tell you what it was like having Alzheimer's, like what it was. And he then could do, pass all the tests. So it reversed, and uh, and I sent it to, to Willie, your producer. He should show it to you. For sure. I mean, like right now. I, yeah. I, I want to look into it. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, um, I, I happen to own a large part of a nutraceutical company. I happen to know the right people to call. I'm definitely gonna. I'm definitely gonna look into what you're talking about. That's uh, yeah, yeah. Look at the video, and it's uh, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. I don't know how difficult it is, but. You're a pretty powerful girl, uh, I, a woman. I've seen you in public settings and speaking and stuff like that. And I wondered kind of out loud, given your, the, the fact that you do have a following and sort of a power about you, you know, I, I have a very traditional marriage. My wife and I are like a 1950s couple. I know people like come over to my house and my wife brings me dinner and they like freak out. <laughs> They're like, That's ridiculous. That what world do you beautiful. live in? Um, no, I think that's beautiful, and I wish that you know it's it is she's happy doing that, and that's that's her life. And then then why would anybody have anything to say about that? I think it's beautiful, and there are people who want to be a wife and want to be a mother, and that's their job, and they love that. When, I, for, when, when I I see met her, society like getting down on that, it's crazy. When I met her, um, you know, she said she wanted to have a family. We have four kids. Um, I, you know, I was married before to a lawyer. And it was difficult for me to travel and have not my wife with me. So I was like, had really like my wife to be able to travel with me. And so long story short, we had kids and then she couldn't travel with me. But that's okay (laughs) um, because, you know, you have a family at home and stuff like that. But I wondered like for you, um, what what is like this sort of balancing act? I've seen you and Elena together. And what's the balancing act for you? For those who people don't know, I think Elena Cardone Grant Cohn's wife is the best part of the whole thing with Grant Cardone. Um, yeah, she's, she's a awesome. she's a very powerful person, and she's you're awesome. you're the same way. I wonder what's that like in the sort of dating world for you, being a public figure. I don't know. I'm always like I'm a serial monogamous. I'm, I'm monogamous. I hate say that. Um, I just stay in relationships for years, and I have I, you know, I I always it always trips me out a bit when people who've been in relationships, uh, they come out of it and they destroy the person. I'm like, but you're the one who stayed and you're the one who picked this person. And I, and it's like, I, I there's no like long-term boyfriend I've had that I could ever say anything bad about. Doesn't mean because we didn't work out. Doesn't mean they're a bad person. We just didn't work out. Um, but I love them and they're good people, you know? Mm-hmm. So even the ones I, I we had a bad breakup. You know, I take responsibility for it and you move on, but you don't hate them. And I it always, it's like, there's no responsibility level I see when people just start saying they did this, they did that, but you stayed and you stayed in the relationship. And that, at that point, when you knew he was doing this or she was doing that, you stayed. And mm-hmm. so then that is on you and you shouldn't, you know, I, that's how I always look at it. So I take responsibility for the stuff that didn't work out and they're good people. And all I do is just wish them luck. Mm-hmm. And we stayed friends. Most of my my exes were friends. What happened to the days? I thought I used to listen to you. I thought I used to hear you. Weren't you like on the radio with Nikki Six or someone? 
yeah, we had a show for, I don't know, four and a half years, almost five years, uh, The Sixth Sense with Nikki Six. Right. We, we were on iHeartRadio and we traveled all around the world. I, when, when Motley Crue went on uh, you know, tour, I went on tour with them and we did the radio show before they would go on stage every night. And, really? Yeah, it was it was a fun show and it was something else. I was, you know, horses and rock music and hair bands, that was it for me. And I got to do... Both of the things that I absolutely loved as a child. I always, I always I kind of came back. I always thought I would wake up one day and see you like Elaine DeGeneres, Ellen DeGeneres, like uh, have your own talk show because you know you know everybody. It seems like you know a lot of people, and you're engaging and thoughtful and interesting to listen to. I've I've watched you speak a couple times. I've been to a couple events where you've spoken. Um, is this something that interests you or is it not on your horizon here? Because I think as you're a kind of a natural host and I, yeah, w- I always wonder. I could definitely wondered- do that. I could definitely do that. That's something that would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've done it doing, you know, I've been in talk radio for 23 years and it is like having your own show. It's just there's not a camera in your face. And I loved radio for so many years because I could go in my sweats with my hair up and no makeup. And now everything is on video, everything yeah. is on social media, so it's completely changed. So you might as well just, you know, go to TV. <laughs> hey, so are you are you on any shows now, or what are you doing in that regard? Um, on, on TV, just the documentaries that they've they've shot me. For no, I mean like on any radio shows. I, I would expect you. I, see, I know you have the podcast, but I would expect it. Like, are you hosting anything now in terms of radio? Yeah, I, I just. Um, I just quit. Well, it was just this last year that I quit my my show on KBC. It was a law show. I was on that for seven years, and uh, you know, I did. I worked on this, this podcast for a year, and uh, now I'm into producing. And I have um, a couple shows that have gotten picked up by with production companies. So mm. I also I didn't tell you, but I also have those, and uh, they're pretty fun. I'm very excited about them. But you know, you never know if they're going to go. It doesn't. You know, just because somebody picks it up and says, "Let's do the sizzle. Let's go." doesn't mean it's going to make it to air. So if it does, I'll let you know. I uh, hope we can be supportive of your decision to do a documentary on your dad. I, I, I know Willie's listening to this. So I definitely say, Willie, this is something I want to be part of. I'm a huge fan of Carrie, and I was a huge fan of her dad, still am. In fact, I listened to your dad today on purpose before we got on the show. So, oh, that's awesome. Carrie, I've always envisioned that there would be something that you and I would do together yeah. in media or something. So hopefully if there's a project or if there's a, an opportunity to support your charity or for you to speak at an event, um, you do work I love. Um, I'm still fascinated by how you were rescuing all those dogs. You haven't covered, oh, you haven't yeah. covered me like you were like, like suddenly a firewoman. Can you, can yeah, you no, give, me, give me a little humor there? What did you say? I, <laughs> I have a wonderful disaster relief group and I, I absolutely love them. And I, I put up all the videos. I just got back from Haiti. Um, so I was there for 10 days uh, after the earthquake that happened that nobody talked about on the media, which is so shameful, but um, that uh, it was, it was, it was horrible. They had another huge earthquake there and people needed things. So uh, I just, I was in Haiti 2010 after that horrible earthquake that killed hundreds of thousands of people. So I just hopped on a plane and went back out there. And um, I just got back. And so that's the group you're talking about. We, whatever is needed and wanted, we are there. So, you know, with, with the fires we rescued, I'm like, I have a video of me carrying a, a, like a sheep and a lamb and chickens and mm-hmm. like the dogs and everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, whatever, you know, we could do, we did uh, during the Woolsey fire, but I've, you know, been to the flooding in Texas and Tampa and the hurricanes, the earthquake in Mexico. And just whatever or whenever I can help, I go. And I swear, if I would have known about, you know, like disaster relief, I would have probably done that before getting into radio or anything else. I just, I love traveling and I love helping people. So it's, it, when when they call, I go. Carrie, you're, you're definitely on the front lines. I've seen you out there. I saw you, uh, you know, driving near the fire. So you, no one could argue that you're uh do you show up for any other reason other than to help people? You definitely drive yourself into harm's way. Yeah. Carrie, uh, yeah. I'm super grateful yeah. that you're willing to do this today. Hopefully everyone watches Bitter Blood, learns about what happened to Carrie and what happened to her family. This is an important topic. Uh, it's, everyone has to watch this. I really think it's important that we support what's happening here. She's changing laws. She's changed laws. Uh, she's definitely brought awareness to elder abuse, an advocate for the elderly. 
Carrie Kasem, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much. You know, I'm going to explain to you. Real quick. Continue walking. But don't be wrong yet. There's a reason for it. So, so I did get that right. I did get that yeah, right.